according to taking it personally. Every one of us have a personal responsibility to share the gospel. So let me ask you a question. You've been sitting in church. You've been hearing this message. You've been hearing this lesson over and over again. And on Wednesday nights, pastor's been hammering it, hammering it, hammering it, hammering it. You reap a harvest where you place an emphasis. So let me ask you this question. What is your heart like for the lost? When's the last time you said, how do I measure that? When's the last time you shared the gospel? When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus Christ? Well, well, that's what they do at church. No, no, no. The Great Commission was given to believers. Yes, corporately, we're involved in getting the gospel, but we ought to be involved in it personally as well. So when's the last time you shared the gospel? When's the last I was talking to, or I was uh, getting a coffee today uh, with uh, Sam, and we were at Nine Line, and I was getting a coffee, and, and uh, there were some folks behind the counter that was talking about this, this submarine that's lost. Well, that's a tragic story. I read about it, and it, it, the information that was given in the article I read said there were two billionaires on board this submarine. One billionaire had his son, and the CEO of the company that designed and built the submarines on board. And here's what struck me about this, this moment. All the money in the world can't save you. All the knowledge in the world cannot save you. All the youthfulness and strength that you personally possess cannot save you. There's four men and sitting on the bottom of the ocean somewhere. I, I don't know what's going on, but I do know this. The only thing that matters in their life at this moment is do they know Jesus Christ? Do they know Jesus Christ? I said to the group of people that was talking about it, I said, the only thing that will matter in this moment is do they know Jesus? You know, the only thing that will matter when life is over is do you know Jesus? The only thing that will matter in your neighbor's life is do, you know, do they know Jesus? And the responsibility to get the gospel to our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers is commanded by God, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so if God places an emphasis on the gospel, then we ought to place an emphasis on the gospel, right? And so we're dealing with presenting the gospel. I want you to, to write there, make sure you have all the blanks. I'm going to go through here quick, all right? So we're dealing, Roman numeral number one, sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel. We, I'm not going to make much comment because if I do, uh, they'll, it'll, it'll take a lot of time, all right? Uh, it's sharing the gospel. Uh, number one, avoid extremes. You don't have to work up the gospel. There's a danger in that. You don't have to work up the gospel. If the Holy Spirit is not moving and working in somebody's heart and life, their eyes aren't going to be open anyway. Avoid the extremes. You don't have to sell the gospel. It's not a car. It's not a home. It's not some pyramid scheme. You just share the gospel. Avoid extremes. Secondly, have a plan. Have a plan. We've worked through this, and I'm not going to take the time to do it, but I've talked to you about how to talk to someone about the gospel, the verses you ought to try to commit to memory, the things you ought to try to say. You know, how, how can we as Christians, how can we as Christians, you know, I, I remember being a young man and going to school and having to take a test. I didn't like tests. I'll be honest with you. I wasn't a real big fan of school. I, I wanted summer to be nine months and school to be three months. How many were like that? How many were the other, the other, the other people? Yeah. Mm -mm. I was the opposite, right? Man, in school we had tests. And you know what? I had to go in and study for tests. My sister, she was very smart. She didn't have to study that much. My brother, he was some smart. He had to study a little bit. I was not smart. I had to study a whole lot. Man, I had to make preparation so I could do well. You know, we ought to make preparation in our life to be ready to share the gospel. Be ready always. Be instant in season, out of season. To be ready. So we talk about having a plan. And listen, you don't have to share the gospel that I, the same way I share the gospel. You don't have to say the same things that I say. And somebody says, well, I don't know what to say. Just tell people what happened to you. Tell people how Jesus Christ changed your life. But have a plan. So be give it, giving a clear presentation. So we talked about sharing the gospel, understanding the gospel, uh, giving a clear presentation. We said, first of all, you have to understand that God loves you. I gave this to you very quickly. Number two, 
You have to realize your condition. Number three, you have to notice God's price for sin. You know, there is a price for sin. You cannot just live any way that you want to and think, well, it's all going to be swept under the rug. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice God's price for sin. Believe that Christ died for you. Confess your faith in Jesus Christ. I'm talking about having a plan. This is leading us to having a plan and, and, and making sure we're, and you're given all the Scripture, you're given all the reference, and, and you, may not have to, you may not memorize every verse there, but you can commit one of those verses to memory. So why do, we, why do we pound and why do we teach and why do we push and promote Scripture memory with these children? How many of you know it's a whole lot easier to memorize Scripture when you're 10 than when you're 10 times 5? Right? Man, we have a hard time remembering where our keys are. They can memorize that. We're trying to... What did Paul tell Timothy? That from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Right. Commit the Scripture to memory. Just one of them. <clears throat> Commit them to memory. All right? Then leading to a decision. This is... Brother Tim, grab me that water, please. i got something in my throat here. <coughs> I usually have a water up here already. Brother Jim brings me one, and I have one up here. And I got none. I have no water. I have wells without water. That's what the Bible says, right? <coughs> <coughs> then we talk about leading to a decision. You know, sometimes the reason we, we don't have an opportunity to lead someone to Christ is because we never ask them. How many times have you gone to a person and talked to them about the Lord and you said something like this? And th this is something that I use. So I'll talk to people, when I talk to people about the Lord, and, and honestly, it's very easy in today's culture to turn the conversation to spiritual matters because of the craziness of the world. I mean, listen, people who don't know the Lord can look at what's going on in the culture and go, man, it's crazy out there. And so when I get to that point, I might say something like this, man, I'm glad that my hope doesn't rest in what's going on in this world. My hope rests in Jesus Christ. And it naturally leads into a spiritual conversation. Because there was a day in my life when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. There was a day that I understood I was lost without Jesus Christ, that God loved me. And I put my faith and trust in Him. And I've never regretted one moment that decision. You can easily turn. But you can leave it there. I can share that testimony and I can leave it there without ever saying, have you ever trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? You know, the gospel by its very nature is confrontational. Right? By its very nature, it's confrontational. As a matter of fact, a lost person who hears you talk about your salvation experience will naturally expect you to ask them about theirs. And sometimes we just go to the place where we say, I'll tell you, the greatest thing I've ever done is trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. And that's wonderful without ever asking, have you ever done that? Have you ever made that decision? Have you ever made that choice? And that's what we talk about in leading to a decision. Don't be afraid to ask a person, do you know Jesus Christ as Savior? And we give an example of a prayer. And then we talk about preparing to share the gospel. And I gave you just a few things about, uh, about uh, this idea of preparing to share the gospel. I'm not going to take the time to go through them this evening. But I want, you to, I want to draw your attention to Roman number number two here, dealing with common questions. Dealing with common questions. What do you believe, uh, probably everybody in this room would say the same thing. What do you believe is the greatest deterrent to sharing the gospel? What do you believe? Somebody talk to me. Fear, pride, right? Fear of what? Let, let's stop for just a moment. How many of you have ever been asked a question that you don't know the answer to? Every dad in this room can raise your hand. How do you know that? Because the kids will come to you and they will say, Dad, can I just do this? And what is your response? I don't know. Ask your... There you go. Ask your mom. I don't know. Ask your mom. Dad, is this okay? I don't know. We get asked questions by our kids we don't know the answer to, right? 
But we use that and it becomes a, a crutch sure. for not sharing the gospel. Yeah. We're fearful. What if they ask me something I don't know? Let me go ahead and help you. They're going to ask you something you don't know. Amen. Say, how do you know that? Because God said in His Word, if you knew everything about Jesus, the world couldn't contain it. Right. If you knew everything about the Lord Jesus Christ, if everything was written about Him, this world couldn't contain it. Right. You know one of the best statements you'll ever learn when it comes to ministry? Let me get back to you about that. Now, we don't want to say that because our pride swells up, doesn't it? And I'm the pastor. I'm supposed to know everything. I'm supposed to know the, all, all the answers. One of the greatest statements I ever learned is, let me pray about that. I'll get back with you on it. I'd rather say the right thing than to be prideful and lead somebody the wrong way. Right? Right? So, we're, we're prideful. Miss Alma, you, you raise your hand right here. Oh, man, good. Good. That, that's what I always used to say in school whenever I was asked a question. <laughs> what, she, what, what he said. <laughs> right. So, so, leading to a decision. Pride, fear. What about busyness? I'm too busy. I'm too busy. All of us. Remember, I shared this with you recently. We have one priority as believers. One priority, and that is God. Please mark that down. There's one priority, and that's God. Now, because we are believers and we have that one priority, out of that priority, there are many responsibilities. I have the responsibility to be the right kind of Christian first. Before I'm anything else, before I'm anything else, I'm a Christian. Everything else in my life flows through that filter. And the struggle in many believers' hearts and many believers' minds when it comes to the gospel is that is not the first responsibility. They have many other ones. Well, my, my first responsibility is to be successful. That's not your first responsibility. Your first responsibility is to filter everything in your life through the, through the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. Everything else flows through that. Because I'm a Christian, I ought to want to be a great husband. By the way, I can't be the husband I should be without the Lord. There are many good men trying to be good fathers, and they do good. But they're not what they could be because they do not know the Lord. If I want to be a good father, i got to be Christian first. If I'm going to be a good employee, Christians ought to be the best employees. Christians ought to be the best employees. If I'm going to be whatever else it is that I have, other responsibilities that I have in my life, it all begins with my relationship with God. Out of that, everything else flows. So when we begin to get our responsibilities out of order, when God is not the priority, everything else crumbles. And so we're talking about dealing with common questions. So we get busy. We deal with pride. We become fearful. Not only do I think busyness, and people are busy, but there's, there's also an apathy that creeps in. I don't have to do that. Got too many, there, there's too many other things that are important. And we excuse it away and it becomes laziness. And the church has gotten lazy with the responsibility of being personally involved in the Great Commission. I believe, to be honest with you, there, we do get fearful. We do have pride. And, and listen, there are things that, that happen in our life that we have to make decisions about. You ever seen a, you ever seen a, a mom, a child get hurt and a mom deal with that? And if it's somebody else that hurt them, you ever seen the mom, you know, Deal with that. It's amazing how the fear disappears. I think the struggle that the church, the Christian, that the church is dealing with and Christians are dealing with, the biggest struggle in this area of the gospel is apathy and laziness. We just don't do it. How can we expect God to bless our life and our ministry? 
if the most important thing in his life, Jesus said this, I have come, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. More abundantly. Sinners to repentance. That was his purpose. If we cannot take the most important thing to God and at least put it on our list of responsibilities, how can we expect God to bless? Right. By the way, that doesn't mean you've got to walk around with a family Bible and a three-point sermon and a poem every day to give to every person you meet. The best sermons are lived, not preached. Amen. The greatest thing people ought to know about you is that you're a Christian. And they ought to know that through the way you live, not just the words you say. It doesn't take anything to hand a track out. It doesn't take anything to start to plant a seed. But we have to deal with these objections. And the first objection we have to deal with is the objection that we have. Our personal responsibility. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians, all right? Just a few pages over. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. If you're in 2 Corinthians, say amen. amen. All right, good. All right, so we're dealing with common questions. And I'm going to get to these in just a moment. But I want to show you why why we must deal with our objection to the gospel. By the way, I'm glad that the person that shared the gospel with us wasn't lazy in their responsibility. I'm glad the preacher that was preaching when I got saved, or the preacher that was preaching when you got saved, or the Sunday school teacher, or the worker that led you to Christ, I'm glad they weren't lazy in their responsibility to share the gospel. We don't pay people to share the gospel. That's not what missions work is. So I don't have to share the gospel, I give to missions. You ought to go in missions. We don't pay missionaries to share the gospel for us. We, we support missions work around the world so the gospel can go forth to places that we can't go. But there are oftentimes the objection in our life that we must deal with, and Paul draws attention to it here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Look what he says in verse number 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you, beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ that be ye reconciled to God. We are ambassadors to Christ. The same word here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is used in Romans chapter number 12 when Paul is writing and he, is, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So when we talk about these common, common objections, this part of what I'm giving you is not in the lesson, so there's not a blank you're going to miss, but I want you to write some things down. You say, the first objection we have to deal with is us. We have to stop saying no to our responsibility. All right? It really doesn't matter what someone else may say in your gospel presentation if you never give it. You follow me? Their response is, is, a, moot, is a moot point. If we don't share it. So Paul says to, to the Christians here, he says, remind yourself, you're an ambassador for Christ. How do we deal with this objection? Number one, we have to remember God has called us to share the gospel. Write it down. Our objection must be dealt with like this. God has called me to do this. I said to a young man just recently, I said, who was praying about ministry, I said, you need to know God's called you to ministry. I'm talking about specifically uh, church work ministry. But there are things in ministry God has called every Christian to. And one of them is sharing the gospel. He said, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent the Lord. On your job, you represent the Lord. Brother Will, Miss Laura, represent the Lord in Ecuador. In your neighborhood, you represent the Lord. We go in Christ's stead. We're ambassadors. We represent Him. God's called us to share. How do we deal with the objection? Well, you better remember God's called you to do it. How many of you know, I was, I was listening to someone the other day, and they were sharing a story about someone, and, and, and they were talking to a young person, and the young person, they told the young person to do something, and the young person said this, you're not my parent. <laughs> now, if I would have said that, I would have been talking to you like this tonight. Okay, until I got dentures, all right? Do you understand the person who's asked us to share the gospel is our Heavenly Father? The one that spoke the world into existence, that breathed into your nostrils the breath of life? 
God's called us. How do we deal with the objection? You better remember God's called you. By the way, people who won't do for the Lord will have a hard time doing for anyone else. If God doesn't motivate them, the preacher's not going to motivate them. Someone who claim, I'm talking about someone who claims to know the Lord. God doesn't motivate them. Man, I can preach to my heart's content. I can share illustration after illustration. But there, the motivation, Paul said, is the love of Christ that constrains me. So you have to deal with this, this objection by understanding God's called you to do it. But look at secondly in this passage. Look up, we're going to go backwards here. Look at verse number 17. Verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Hold all things are become new. We have to deal with this objection in our life because we understand that God has called us. But secondly, you need to deal with this objection because God has changed you. Amen. People say, well, I'm, you know, you ask people about their salvation experience. And sometimes you'll hear people say, well, you know, I'm not what I ought to be. But thank the Lord, I'm not what I used to be. You know why that is? Salvation's changed in your life. God's changed you. You know, the person that gets saved, has, a, has an, when the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things become new. When, when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you, immediately, somebody says, somebody says well, well am I, am I, if I get saved, if I ask Jesus Christ to be my Savior and I sin, does that mean that I need to get saved again? Let me help you out here, okay? How many in this room are saved? Amen. How many have sinned since you've been saved? I have, a, I, have a, I have not received a glorified body, and I have to deal with sin. That's why he told us if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Somebody says, if I sin after I get saved, am I, am I still saved? Well, if you were able to lose your salvation, then it was, number one, not eternal life. It was an everlasting life. Secondly, if you're able to lose your salvation, then Jesus Christ was a liar. I I didn't say it. The Lord did. Thirdly, if Jesus Christ wasn't a liar and you could lose your salvation, then He would have to go to the cross again, which means that Scripture is not true. All three of those are are not possible. The Bible says God cannot lie. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, always existing. They cannot lie. So there is no losing salvation. There are people who want to take a a certain passage and try to take the Bible and say, you know, you can lose your salvation, you can fall away. I don't believe in the context of Scripture, that's what the Lord was intending. In the context of Scripture, I believe He's dealing with people who heard the gospel and rejected it and never were born again. And so, when you think about the change that Christ has made in you, yes, we still have to deal with the sin nature. Yes, we still have to deal with sin. We have to ask the Lord for forgiveness. But it ought to motivate us to be uh, faithful in giving the gospel because of the difference Christ has made in us. Ask yourself this question, where would you be without the Lord? Where would you be without the Lord? What if you were on a sub tonight and you didn't know Jesus Christ as Savior? What would would it mean? Where would you be without the Lord? That ought to motivate us because the best life I've ever been given is the life that God gave me. All right? Number three, we ought to fight the objection or or, or deal with the objection in our own life, not only because God has called us and God has changed us, but look with me, if you would, please, in verse number 14. I'm giving you this so you can mark it in the passage here. Look, for the love of Christ constraineth us not only has god called us to share the gospel god has changed us so we so we can share the gospel but he has shown compassion on us so we ought to share the gospel you didn't deserve salvation i didn't deserve salvation right i didn't deserve it you didn't deserve it so I grew up in church. I, 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 I was going to church nine months before I was born. It took just as much of God's grace to save you out of a Sunday school class as it did to save that person 
out of prison. God's shown compassion on us. For God so loved the world. I love explaining this. I love talking about this. God didn't look down on us and go, oh, a bunch of idiots. They can't do anything right. That's why I believe it's sad when churches take that position. I believe we ought to have the same, we ought to have the same disposition that Jesus had. John 3, 16 begins with this, for God so loved. You know, when God loved us, we were enemies. Paul said, enemies of the cross of Christ. The very ones trying to share the gospel, I was putting to death. That's what Paul said. God loved us. God loved us. Listen, he didn't see us in a three-piece suit sitting in a church on Sunday morning. You know where he saw us? He saw us hung out over hell. And he loved us. Therefore, he gave his son. That kind of motivation, the motivation that's born out of love, is the greatest motivation. I love my wife. I love my children. I'd, I'd fight anyone in the world for them. Because I love them. You would too. I don't have any grandchildren. Some of you that have grandchildren tell me that it's, it's even worse with grandchildren. I mean, you, you kill your own kids <laughs> for your grandkids. <laughs> right? Why? Because you love them. Do you understand that's how God loves us? And when we look at how God has had compassion on us and His love for us, we ought to remove the objection of the gospel. Amen. I can't share the gospel. No, no, you can share the gospel. Why? Because you love the Lord. Look at this one, number four, write this down. We have to deal with the objection. Uh, we, we dealt with the fact that God has called us, that He has changed us, He has compassion on us. But please don't miss this one. Wherefore we labor, verse number 10, or verse number 9, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. God's not only changed us, He's not only called us, and He's not only had compassion on us, but we have to deal with the consolation that He'll give us. We must all stand before the Lord. You would much rather do what God has asked you to do because He's asked you to do it. You would much rather do what God has asked you to do because He's asked you to do it. You would much rather do it because of how He has changed you because of the gospel. You would much rather do it because you love Him and He loves you, he loves you and you love Him than to not do it and have to stand before Him. The Bible tells us that God's going to have to wipe away all the tears in heaven. There are some things we do not know about Scripture, about a lot of things we do not know about eternity. The Bible says, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for, the, prepared for those that love Him. There are a lot of things we do not know. But I believe that the reason God is going to have to wipe the tears away is because there will be many people that we know that we should have shared the gospel with. That we did not. And we're going to watch them, the Bible says, bound and cast into the lake of fire. And on that day, there will be nothing that we can do about their eternity. But today, there is. You see, the greatest objection that we must deal with when it comes to common objections to the gospel is not the objection that everybody else gives. It's the objection that we often offer the Lord for reasons that we do not do what He's asked us to do. God's called you to do it. He's changed your life. He's had compassion on you. And one day you're going to stand before Him and deal with the consolation of it all. I hope our church 
I hope we understand. I hope the people who walk into this doors, these doors, and, and I'm thankful to the Lord for the folks He's bringing in and, and how God is growing the church. But please understand something. The gospel is at the forefront of all we do. Getting men and women, boys and girls to Jesus Christ is the purpose of our existence. The Great Commission was not only a message of change, but there's a, there's a message of growth that comes with the Great Commission. We're to teach them to grow in the Lord. We just don't catch the fish and throw them in the boat. No, there's a purpose. There are objections, but the greatest objection that you have to deal with and I have to deal with is the objection that I offer. Right. Well, I can't do that. That's not for me. That's somebody else's responsibility. I'm too tired. I'm too busy. I'm afraid. I got too much going on. Lord, I need, to, I need to just take a break. An older preacher said this to me one time. By the way, I was listening to Brother Trebolsi when he was here from Lebanon. How many of you were in that service? Man, when that guy got done preaching, I said, I don't do anything. I'm like, man, I need to get something done. 60-something years old. I don't know when he sleeps. An older preacher told me one time, he said, you can sleep when you get to heaven, but you won't need it then. And I want us to make the biggest difference for the Lord we can make. And we will never do that if we're lazy with the gospel. The biz biggest objection we must face and deal with is the objection that we offer. Some of these common objections, I'm not going to, I'm not going to preach them tonight. I want to give them to you so you can write them down. And, and, and we'll, we'll move along. I've always been a Christian. You ever talk to somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ and they say, I've always been a Christian? Well, we know that's not true, right? There was no man, woman, boy, or girl born a child of God. The Scripture's given there. Secondly, write this one down. I've asked God to forgive me many times. I've asked God to forgive me many times. Thirdly, write this one down. This is too simple. I need to do something to earn it. I always ask this question when people say that, well, what, what do you think you could do to earn it? And if earning it was your, was your plan, why aren't you doing it? If earning it was your plan, why aren't you doing it? Write this one down if you would, please. Number four, I'm good enough. I'm not a very bad sinner. Comparison is the highest form of carnality, right? I'm not a bad sinner. I'm not, I'm not compared to you or you're not compared to me. The standard is Jesus. You know what Jesus was? Perfect. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Write the next one down. Doesn't death end everything? How do we know there's a real heaven? Doesn't death end everything? How do we know that there's a real heaven. We're giving you scripture for all of these. You've got them there in the lesson. Number six, I don't want to give up my lifestyle or my friends. I don't want to give up my lifestyle or my friends. I think as long as I'm sincere, number seven, in what I believe, that's all that matters. You know, church, I'm grateful for the love of God in our life. And I'm glad the Lord has been compassionate to us. But we make a grave mistake in Christian culture today when we believe all faiths, or let me say it this way, all religions are the same. A person can be sincere about what they believe and die and go to hell. As a matter of fact, some of the most sincere people in all the world are deceived. I've seen people who are more sincere in what they believe that is not true than we Christians are when we believe uh, that is the, that which is the truth. Can I tell you the people who flew the planes into, into the World Trade Center on 9-11 were some of the most sincere people you'll ever meet. But just because they were sincere didn't mean they went to heaven. And not all religions are, are truth. Say, Pastor, that's, that's narrow-minded. No, it's single-minded. There's a difference. If, if you believe what the Catholic Church teaches about eternity, you're going to die and go to hell. 
Now, I know that's not common. But someone who's being deceived would rather someone on this side of eternity tell them the truth. And they receive Jesus Christ as Savior than to find out when they stand before God and He says, depart from me, I never knew you. Someone who teaches uh, as there are certain, there are certain religions that will put us to shame when it comes to labor for God. And they'll ride a bicycle across states to tell people a false doctrine. But if you believe that, you're believing a lie. You say, preacher, why are you so adamant about this? Because we have become lazy with the gospel. It is not works. It is not sincerity. It is not being good. It is not turning over a new leaf. It is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that God loves all men. All men are sinners. Sin must be paid for. Christ paid for sin. And you must receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Emphatically. And, and listen, I, I don't say that mean or hatefully. I don't. But have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I'm trying to be honest with you. It's not just do whatever and believe whatever. That's not going to get you to heaven. And your friends that you know that are sincere about a false doctrine, you need to share with them the gospel with love and compassion and grace and kindness. But don't hide the truth. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No. For I'm not ashamed. Paul said, I am not ashamed of what? The gospel. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. There is, there is only one gospel. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Lord, I do love you tonight. Thank you for caring for us. For loving us, thank you for these that are gathered in this place. I pray each of us would have a desire to be more faithful with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. May it not be a sideline. May it always be the main line at Bethel Baptist Church. May you give us the courage and boldness. And Lord, despite what's going on in our culture, may you give us the courage and boldness to be lights for you. In Jesus' name, amen.